So welcome back. This session is on technology for peace and it will be chaired by Francesco Mancini. He's IPI's senior director for research and has done a lot of work in his own right on this issue. Uh, there's an edited publication by him out in the, the front area there. Uh, IPI has done a lot of work on this issue, so he certainly knows his stuff. And just recently, a few weeks ago, we had a big meeting uh, in New York very much on this topic of technology for peace. So Francesco, over to you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, welcome back to the 44th IPI Vienna seminar to you and to those who are following us online. Um, we're now shifting themes. We're still staying in the realm of uh, war and peace in the digital age, uh, but touching upon a slightly different set of issues, um, which is technology for peace. And particularly, we were going to talk about peacekeeping, peace building, and humanitarian relief. I think we have a terrific panel of experts which will be able to cover really this broad range of issues. Um, the panel after lunch is always the tough one. Eh? Um, so we will try to be as dynamic as possible uh, and of course encourage uh, your questions and comments from the floor. The way we would like to proceed is to have a quick brief uh, uh, introductory remarks, uh, five, seven minutes, uh, follow up with a couple of questions and then open to you. Um, so let me start uh, with uh, uh, Ms. Amira Haq, who is the uh, Under Secretary General of the United Nations, head of the Department for uh, Field Support. Uh, she has been with the UN system pretty much in every agency and department I can think about. And this is terrific because she really knows the system. Um, and the only things I want to remind you is that she was also the head of the uh, mission in uh, Timor-Leste. So she comes also with uh, a field perspective. Uh, Amira, you have the floor. Well, thank you very much. And um, yes, we will try and keep you all uh, awake. Um, so let me, uh, as uh, Francesco said, you know, we're trying to now, I think, get down to sort of the practical uh, application of uh, technology and, and innovation. And uh, let me start out by saying that uh, the United Nations, I think, is still well uh, behind the curve uh, on embracing technology and innovation. I always <coughs> talk about it as, as sort of a mindset change, uh, and I think that has to happen. But let me start off um, this afternoon by telling you just a, uh, a little um, story um, that happened uh, very recently in, in the DRC, uh, which is the Democratic Republic of Congo. That is the first United Nations mission where we have used uh, unmanned aerial systems. Um, this morning when, uh, you know, there was a lot of discussion about, uh, you know, um, uh, bilateral uh, use of, of technology, uh, you know, there's always <coughs> a sense of envy because, as you know, with the United Nations, uh, it requires the agreement of 193 countries um, to go ahead with, with the use of uh, technology. But in the case of uh, the Democratic Republic of, of Congo, which is the first uh, mission where we have used um, such a system. We are next week, in fact, going to the Security Council uh, to let them know what we have uh, gained and to do a full assessment of, of the use of the technology, and you know that includes the, the the cost and the you know the finances, but also what we have been able to achieve in terms of results. So uh, last week uh, it was decided for the first time uh, that the UAS uh, would go over the water in uh, Lake Kivu, and so we have a Uruguayan riverine unit that is uh, in Lake Kivu, and uh, the UAS was, uh, was launched over the lake, and so you have people studying as it, as it went over the lake. And the idea was to track a, a civilian boat that they knew had, had uh, you know, was, was uh, in the lake. And as the UAS went over, they were able to send pictures, of course, in, in, in real time, and we saw that the boat was actually sinking and people were desperately trying to, you know, I mean, they were f falling off the boat and they were trying to, uh, you know, save themselves. And, uh, and that real-time picture enabled 
the Uruguayans uh, unit and also to tell the Congolese uh, army who also had uh, a riverine capacity and they were able to go to the middle of the lake and they were able to save, uh, there were 20 people on the boat, they were able to save 19, unfortunately one died. And to, um, so there were 14 that were saved immediately by the boats that, uh, that went out. But the other technology that, that, that we had was a better, uh, better and sophisticated <coughs> military uh, attack helicopters from South Africa who were also launched and they were able to you know, put the, um, that, uh, the, the winch uh, cable down and retrieve uh, you know, one passenger who had already gone uh, because of the current had already moved uh, three miles ahead. So in order for us to be able to tell the Security Council you know, in terms of what, what the uses are, I mean, you know, there can be no compelling, I think, um, you know, um, evidence uh, than, than what we saw uh, last week on, on the use of that. But uh, again, as I said, there is always a lot of reluctance, a lot of reticence, and the processes that we need to go through in the UN um, to use the, the technology. Some of it, when I was listening to the discussions this morning, some of it are, in fact, you know, a lot of the questions because it, it uh, centers around, you know, the, the legal framework of using these uh, technologies. You know, who has proprietorship over the information that we collect? Uh, you know, we get the uh, agreement of the, the country, in this case DRC, that said, yes, they want they want these uh, UAS, and so we had their agreement um, to, to do it. Uh, but if there was information collected uh, on a neighboring country, then uh, you know, uh, where does that information, how do we deal with all of that information? And so we can understand that member states do have uh, you know, some legitimate uh, concerns about that. The, on the flip side of that right now with, with the um, situation as it is in South Sudan, uh, you know, we have been now rebuffed by the uh, government in South Sudan to use the UAS um, uh, in, in South Sudan. And yet we feel uh, that there is no more need uh, anywhere than in South Sudan right now, which lends itself to, to this uh, technology and the information uh, that we can get, both for the, uh, you know, both sides um, to the conflict, uh, but um, clearly the government of South Sudan has not given us uh, the uh, agreement despite, uh, you know, I think uh, intervention <coughs> at, the, at the very highest level. So, uh, you know, it is not sometimes that we don't want the technology, but that the, um, the way within which we operate, um, you know, doesn't, um, doesn't allow us. Now, there is, you know, obviously pressures coming from, from uh, you know, a lot of different sides um, with, with South Sudan, and, and, and we'll see where, where it goes. But I think all of this to show that technology has powerful uses in the protection of, of civilian, in the fulfillment of our mandate, and uh, you know, whether it's UAS or whether it's other kinds of technology in Mali, for example, uh, just you know, to enhance our security, and some of you may have read uh, the news this morning that five of our peacekeepers were injured uh, this morning in, uh, in Kidal. Uh, again, it is, you know, the, the better that we can do in terms of our perimeter security, the better that we can do in thermal imaging uh, to see who is uh, approaching our, our premises. Uh, you know, it is not only the protection of our own uh, troops and, and uh, civilian personnel, but protection of, of the personnel, uh, you know, even within the, the, the um, environments of, of uh, of the um, uh, state itself. Um, the United Nations is working in increasingly more complex uh, environments where you know, we are no longer just, uh, uh, you know, our neutrality and impartiality is, is, is questioned and we become 
you know, as much uh, targets for many non-state uh, actors and, and rebel groups and, uh, you know, receive uh, all these um, threats. So again, I think uh, we need to be, to be better prepared to enable us to do our mandate to protect the civilians by, by the use of, um, of uh, technology. Peter um, lonsky tiffenthal mentioned this morning uh, about the use of, uh, of radio. And uh, again, in, uh, and to, you know, I'm using an example that is, that is quite current, but most recently in the fighting that we saw in South Sudan, in uh, Bentiu and, and Malakal, uh, you know, radio was used to incite the violence through hate messages. This, for those of you who remember in, uh, you know, Ivory Coast and uh, also in CAR now, um, is, 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 is a tool that is, uh, that is increasingly used. Again, um, the kind of technology that we can now bring, which allows us to set up broadcasting very quickly, it's sort of like a radio in a box, which allows us to, to um, you know, also uh, get, get on the air, uh, helps mitigate to a certain extent by having messages from community leaders, religious leaders, uh, elders, and others who, who the population may, may listen to. So again, that's, that's an example uh, of that. Um, I work in, uh, uh, in the Department of Field Support, and of course my job is to provide as, 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 as much of the support to all the, all the peacekeeping missions so that we're, you know, they're able to go about uh, the work. And so technology to me doesn't only stop in, in, in the kinds of things that I am saying related to security and safety and better, uh, you know, up-to-date information on, on movements of, of troops and, uh, you know, mine detection work and uh, all of that, but also in terms of how we are able to... Um, to live and you know sort of cohabitate in communities where we set up our presence and there we are very conscious of the environment in in, in which we work uh, we are very uh, conscious that we don't take uh, the resources particularly water for example that you know when we are able to use better GIS and uh, other kinds of information to see where the water sources are, that if we're digging for wells as we've done in Mali, that uh, you know, we share that with the local community and, and, and don't upset uh, you know, kind of agricultural systems and, and other things. Uh, you know, environmental um, consciousness in, 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 in many other ways. Uh, alternative sources of energy. Our colleague from uh, UNIFIL this morning um, talked about uh, the harvesting with, uh, with solar energy. And, uh, you know, these are also, um, you know, different uses of, of technology which uh, go beyond uh, looking at just what we need for our missions, but sometimes has that, uh, you know, spillover effect where communities are quite intrigued by these technologies and then start using them and adapting them themselves um, to, to, to their requirements. And so that is, that is a, uh, a, a good uh, sort of what we call a, s a spillover effect. As I said, the UN is behind the curve on, on using the technology and part of what we want to do is, is to get as much expertise and assistance and here sitting in Austria, I've spoken with some of my colleagues um, who, you know, we, we feel that we can, we can uh, learn a lot from the technology. We have uh, most recently um, put together a panel of five experts. One of the experts is sitting right beside me uh, and uh, they will let us know also how we can um, you know, uh, just uh, how best to leverage uh, new technologies in, in peacekeeping. So let me stop there because I can go on and on in terms of, uh, you know, giving different examples. But I think the critical message is that um, as we go forward in the future, I think it is absolutely incumbent on us to have kind of a, 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 a change and a mindset change uh, that allows us to do smarter peacekeeping. Smarter peacekeeping means that we have better mobility, better agility, we're more nimble, we don't have to have the numbers that we want because technology allows us to get information which earlier on had to be done just by vast and large numbers of troops. 
So we've got to become you know, sort of more tech savvy and smarter in, in the way we do that. And, and uh, so that is what we're, uh, what we're uh, looking at. So um, thank you. I think I'll leave thank you. That. Thank you very much. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times the UN is behind the curve in terms mm -hmm. of technology mm -hmm. development. That doesn't come as a surprise with people mm -hmm. working around the UN. Why do you think it's so? Um, when you were, for example, in East Timor, uh, did you yourself found resistance in you know, accommodating needs, for example, that technology could have uh, satisfied more properly? Yeah. Part of it is what I mentioned earlier, that I think some of, and because of the discussions that we had earlier, that you know, I think the, uh, to a certain extent, reticence of member states uh, to really sort of give us the go-ahead. So in the case of MONUSCO, we've gone ahead and done it, but we will report to the Security Council next week. But some of it is that member states want to have much better and open consultations. And as I said, it isn't just the decision of, uh, you know, the few of us who are at the top uh, at, at, at the UN of these departments to make that decision, because in the end, it is the member states who sanction the budgets and the finances for us to get that technology. So there is quite a bit of a process of helping them to understand and to be able to give us the budgetary authority and the financial authority and everything else to go ahead. So part of it is that. But on the other hand, you know, it doesn't mean that everything rests with the member states and you know, we certainly have uh, a lot of uh, uh, leeway to do that. There is also, uh, for example, just in the uh, ERP system that, you know, that we're changing in, in, in terms of our technology now and uh, you know, how, how we connect with each other, how all our systems connect with each other. Sometimes there are, there's a, uh, you know, a reluctance of the staff themselves at this innovation. Uh, you know, staff are threatened by what they see as you know, our jobs are going to be taken away by technology. And so, you know, you don't get the, the, the full support. Uh, so there are many different reasons. But I must say that when I was, because, because you mentioned the, uh, you know, the time that I was in East Timor, I must say that uh, GIS, you know, in supporting the government in, in elections there, uh, you know, all of those kinds of things were, were you know, very helpful. But also when we look at technology, I think the part that we don't look at is how do we do the human capacity building as well. And that technology has to come in hand in hand with making sure that we are laying the groundwork and that people are able to understand and be familiar with it and understand the benefits of it. Yeah, no, definitely. That's something that we, we realized very much when we started to do our work on, on conflict prevention and new technology. People really mm -hmm. didn't really grasp what yeah. this new technology can do. Thank you very much. Um, Professor Walter Dorn um, is Professor of Defense Studies at the Royal Military College of Canada uh, and at the Canadian Forces College. And I can testify that he has been working on these topics uh, for many, many years because we do have an IPA report in the early 80s with his own handwritten annotations. So um, you, you, you get really also an historical perspective of, on these issues and I think his book on keeping watch of monitoring uh, technology innovation and peacekeeping remains a point of reference for this field. Walter, you have the floor. Thank you, Francesco. Well, I'm delighted to be here with uh, the fellow panelists in this uh, exquisite city. I call it uh, the location of the exquisite arch architecture because of the um, amazing environment. And the, I do go back a fair amount. I was a starry-eyed uh, graduate student um, in the mid-1980s when uh, the International Peace Academy had a seminar on uh, technology and peacekeeping. And I, I, I found out about it only when the report was released. But I spoke to one of my mentors of the time, Inder Jitriki, who was the founder of the International Peace Academy, as well as the Vienna Seminar. And he said, well, um, we'll be sure to have you uh, to speak if, when we have a seminar on technology and peacekeeping. Well, some 30 years later, I'm finally getting the invitation. <laughs> Thank you, IPI. Glad we made it. Uh, yeah. and, uh, and I think it's very timely. There is a more political development happening now in this field than uh, I've actually seen in, in years on technology in large part because of the enlightened leadership of Amira Haq and, and Hervé Ladsus, the Under Secretary General for Field Support and Peacekeeping. 
Well, um, I'm going to speak about technology and peacekeeping and tell you how uh, I went from, a, from an undergraduate student to, uh, to trying to make a difference now in the field. Uh, I was trained in the sciences. And one of the, um, one of the most influential, uh, greatest influences on me was Albert Einstein. And I put on the beginning of my PhD thesis the quote from him, which I'll use modern language to describe, concern for humanity and its fate must form the chief interest of all technical endeavors. Never forget this in the midst of your diagrams and equations. And I uh, have to admit, I've forgotten most of the diagrams and equations that I did in my uh, chemical sensing work, but I haven't forgotten the wise words of uh, Albert Einstein. And I try to look at how technology and how science can be used in the cause of peace. And I, find, and I found that UN peace operations are one of the most concrete expressions of on-the-ground help in conflict areas of showing humanity's concern for humanity. And they are in the field saving lives and preventing suffering. We've just heard about that uh, wonderful example of a UAS, uh, unmanned aerial system, that was overflying Lake Kivu and uh, able to help in rescuing uh, people who had been in a capsized boat. Um, the UN, uh, in the words of Woodrow Wilson, the founder, uh, if anyone was, of international organizations, we know it, um, is to be an eye on the world, an ever watchful eye that never sleeps. Um, and Woodrow Wilson had that vision in 1919 when the League of Nations was formed. And indeed, the only article in the UN Charter that gives the Secretary General a political mandate is Article 99, which states that the Secretary General should bring to the attention of the Security Council matters which may threaten international peace and security. So you have this very high-level strategic mandate to, to keep watch. So my, um, my review was, well, what are the ways in which the UN does keep watch, and how can science help? Well, it has mandates for overseeing ceasefires when uh, war-weary parties finally decide to come to the negotiating table. They'll uh, stop their firing, and the UN has to determine who fired first if there's an outbreak and be able to keep watch over the former battlefields. Much broader in peace agreements, which can now be so extensive in, in terms of the requirements that are placed upon the parties and the UN. Then, since the year 2000, all the multidimensional missions of the UN have had a protection of civilians mandate. And imagine how difficult that is when you have over 50 million people in the DRC, for instance, and you've got to monitor and you're responsible for protection of civilians. Now, most of it, the current work's centered in the Eastern Congo. But it's just an almost impossible mandate to do but it requ and requires a definite surveillance capability. Monitoring elections, even running them. I uh, had the good fortune of being the electoral officer in East Timor in 1999. And uh, I, I knew that there were so many things going on beneath the surface that we couldn't uh, expose because we didn't actually have evidence. But we knew that we knew that it was going on. And at one point, my life was threatened for, because of false information that, that uh, would have best been exposed to how and why they were doing the threatening. Monitoring human rights, huge ex expansion in the special rapporteurs uh, that monitor human rights around the world. Monitoring of sanctions, you know, the sanction busters try and evade the sanctions. Well, the UN's job is to keep the watch and make sure that they can report to the Security Council and the sanctions bodies that these are uh, sanctions busters are working um, in these border areas. Have to monitor armed groups and spoilers of the peace process for early warning. As I mentioned, the Secretary General has an early warning mandate, and so do many missions. Resource exploitation, which are often fueling the fires of conflict by allowing illegal mining and resource extraction and uh, seeing the exchange of guns and trafficking in human people um, in, 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 this, in this vicious cycle. And uh, the UN has to know how those resources are being exploited in order to do something about it. And of course, you need to monitor for threats against safety and security of UN personnel. Um, and there's a, what I call the peacekeeper's dilemma. When the conflict gets the hottest, like uh, the, the, the short mission we had in S Syria, um, when the conflict is hottest, then it's hardest for the peacekeepers to go there because they're putting their lives in danger. That's a, one area where technology can play a gap in order to fill what I call the um, monitoring gap can fill the gap that exists in monitoring and peacekeeping operations. Because the traditional tool of peacekeeping has been, well, the Mark I human eyeball hardly evolved over the last million years, or at least uh, 100,000 years. Uh, it has limited capabilities over large areas, limited at night for underground detection unless you're Superman. 
in remote, difficult terrain? And when you, when you see something, how do you record it if, you're, if you have no device to, to do the recording? Um, analyze it, sharing and storing it, and pass it on. Well, those are the problems. And technology can increase the range and accuracy of your observation. It can allow for continuous monitoring. It can increase the effectiveness. And as Amira suggested, it can improve your cost effectiveness. If you can have, um, as I, I looked at one study on the cameras in Cyprus, where they replaced observation posts, and I discovered that in the first year, it was a savings, a factor of 10 times cheaper to have the cameras there and subsequent years 100 times cheaper than having a 24-hour manned observation post. You can use it to decrease the intrusiveness. If you don't want that presence to be right in the face of the parties, you can, uh, you can uh, of course, you want to have human interaction, but you can control it better when you have technology as a tool. And then increase the safety of the staff in the field to get out of that peacekeeper's dilemma that when the conflict is raging, that's when it's most difficult to observe it. And provides you with recordings and evidence of, the, of what's happened. So this resulted in, um, in some contract work I did for DPK Ho uh, during one of my sabbaticals and then in a book published by UN University Press uh, called Keeping Watch about monitoring technology and innovation in UN peace operations. This is one of the key diagrams and I'll use this as kind of my uh, summary uh, diagram of looking at the technology. We have satellite reconnaissance. In fact, Inderjit Rikki told me that when he was force commander of the UN Emergency Force, in the 1960s, that the, the Americans would come in with satellite or with images, they put it down on his desk in front of him and said, there's a tank that's not in the place where it's supposed to be. So you might want to ask the parties to remove that tank. And he knew that from the UN sources that there'd be no aircraft in the area. And he knew that the Americans were showing him satellite imagery, but they wouldn't allow him to keep it, much to his chagrin. Um, airborne. Well, we, we, we have had examples of uh, equipped jets. In fact, they were provided by Sweden in the Congo in the 1960s, um, SAB jets. Um, but uh, the UN has very seldom used jets afterwards. They have used helicopters for observation. There were uh, four Alouette uh, glass bubble helicopters in the Congo, in addition to those amazing MI-25 helicopters that had fourth generation FLIR, forward looking infrared, also used in the Congo and helped in the rescue operation last week. Um, the UN has just started using UAVs in the Congo. Um, that was a project that was first proposed by uh, the Monarch Mission in 2005. Uh, there were several attempts to procure, but it only uh, happened in 2013. But actually, it was an achievement because the expression of interest only came out in January of 2013. And by December of 2013, you had a system with initial operating capability working in the field. Aerostats, I think, is a is, is really future, I mean, within the next few years, that we'll see that this is a very cheap way of getting some aerial surveillance on a tethered balloon that you can use as a landmark, uh, can help as a waypoint, and that uh, can give you the bird's eye view without uh, all the expense. I have myself just purchased a, a tethered balloon for $1,500, putting a Hero GoPro camera on it, and uh, getting some excellent imagery from the air. Um, and it might be very useful in, in Mali, for instance, where you, you, you have peacekeepers attack in airfields that are, that are being um, mined or uh, improvised explosive devices are being put there to have a 24-hour watch. On the ground, you have ground-penetrating radar, which could be used for uh, monitoring weapons. Often the parties, they'll go to the conflict, they'll come out of the conflict, but they want to have their insurance policy, which is that they still have the weapons, yet they're supposed to participate in the disarmament, demobilization, reintegration program. But how do you find all those weapons? Often they're just buried in strategic locations in the ground. Well, ground penetrating radar can help you locate those weapons, um, and it can also help you locate the sites of atrocities where there are mass graves. You can uh, help see what's underneath the ground. Ground surveillance radar can be used to be able to do monitoring at five, even 10 kilometers to see a person or a vehicle moving. Um, this is good for camp protection. I'll show an example of a GSR that was used by the Irish Crick Reaction Force in Liberia. Um, then we have seismic detectors, which can detect the sound of you know, people walking um, even 10 meters away on, uh, if you're in a rocky area, or the sound of tanks. Uh, the, that is the vibration of tanks in the ground. Or even the sound. I have a colleague in, in Germany who's looking at uh, acoustic sensors to be able to detect the difference between a Leopard 1 and a Leopard 2 tank or, or between different types of vehicles. And um, in fact, uh, I saw an early example of that in Unperfor in Bosnia where the um, different parties would put their weapons into cantonment 
in storage areas. There'd be a key for the UN and a key for or a lock for the UN and a lock for the party. Now they would often break out of their ceasefire agreement, so they'd knock off the locks and they start the vehicles up. Well, this very smart uh, person decided to put a one-way radio there. So as soon as the um, as soon as the vehicles could start up, you know he could hear them in the uh, at the, the uh, post which was in the distance, and he could say, "Oh, they're at it again. Let's try and head them off on the road so they can't bring." their tanks and armored personnel carriers into the battleground. And then all of this information can be fed into a rapid response movement so that you can create a new uh, modus operandi for some missions, which I call um, mo mobile missions with information or situational awareness. Greater situational awareness causing concentration of forces with, mobile, with mobility. And that can be uh, tasked to the wide areas that the UN often finds as their um, main area of operation. There was an example we had of UAVs used in peacekeeping, but it wasn't by the UN. The um, Bee Hunter UAV that the Belgians provided for the 2006 uh, elections in the Congo, they proved extremely useful. Uh, they were under the European Union force. And uh, the image feed that came from the Bee Hunters was provided to the UN, but not through an image feed, but rather the UN was invited to the EU4 headquarters to be able to observe what was on the big screen there that the uh, UAS was seeing. And here's an example. Both sides, um, both the president and the vice president, were engaged in an arms race. The president, Kabila, was shipping in tanks, which was against Security Council um, rules. And the vice president was shipping in small arms across the Congo River. And they were trying to hide these activities, but the UAV, using thermal imagery and image intensification was able to detect this arms race and so the SRSG could go to the parties and, and show them the evidence and uh, try and get them stopped and at one point uh, SRSG Bill Swing was in the compound of the vice president when there was an attack on the compound this UAS image was taken of the explosion of the helicopter just outside uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba's quarters uh, when there was an attack and the UN had to be mobilized to be able to prevent the SRSG, the vice president, and others inside the compound from being killed. And fortunately, that uh, mission was coordinated through the uh, UAS system that was there at the time. This is the ground surveillance radar that was used by the Quick Reaction Force. So it uh, circles around uh, about once, once a minute and is able to be a little bit like an airplane radar detecting aircraft, except it's on the ground and can see a ground movement. Now you have to set the settings so that you're not, uh, it doesn't giving you false alerts when their animals are coming. Now sensors, uh, well the, the key example of this was something the US set up to monitor the peace agreement after the Yom Kippur War of 1973. Uh, they set up the Sinai field mission, they put ground sensors in the strategic passes in the Sinai desert, the Gita and Mitla passes, and they used uh, both acoustic seismic detectors, infrared, uh, and that is night vision, and um, as well as the, they had observation posts and they coordinated with the UNF-2 mission that was there. And I have to say that, ever, that that was an example that you have to draw from the 1970s. So the UN is only now um, beginning to explore this and hasn't deployed those sensors in the field. So when I joke with UN headquarters staff, I say, well, we're really, I want to bring the UN into the 1970s. The parties to a peace agreement actually wanted uh, real-time monitoring of facilities so they asked that when the uh, Nepali Comprehensive Peace Agreement was signed, they put in this diagram which said that the UN should surve have surveillance over the weapons cantonment sites. So um, they have uh, sea containers filled with weapons that the Maoist guerrillas have been put in and the government forces put in this equivalent amount. And they were, on, keep, they were being watched by a surveillance camera as well as actual people there. But the evidence was there, and at one point they were even thinking, should we put this on the internet to, to give the whole world this view of what's happening with the peace agreement? I mentioned um, some sites in the Green Line in Cyprus that were replaced by cameras. Some pictures I took while walking the, the Green Line with uh, Turkish forces just uh, 10 meters away and Greek forces 10 meters on the other side. And these cameras are, are used to be able to detect any violations and have actually caused what previously were routine violations to be to stop when the parties were presented with the visual evidence having denied them before. In fact, uh, one story is of a, of a Swedish peacekeeper who invited uh, the uh, Turkish uh, battalion commander up to for some evening tea 
and said, well, we just set up a, a night vision camera here. Would you like to have a look? And then he looked through the device and he saw his own men violating the ceasefire accord. And the UN sort of subtly um, pointed that out to him. And the next day it stopped when, when they could see the UN was actually uh, monitoring them and couldn't deny it anymore. A very sophisticated system is a, is a reconnaissance vehicle that has the technology built into it so it can be mobile. The Canadians deployed that in the Ethiopian Eritrean mission. And one of my soldiers, uh, students um, at the Command and Staff College, he was actually uh, in charge of a squadron of these vehicles, and he said that if it was 15 of them, he could monitor the entire Ethiopian Eritrean temporary security border, uh, border, well, it's a zone which borders the two countries. And that the parties were always trying to tell the Canadians, oh, we're going to be passing through the here, because they knew that they would be able to detect them with the infrared and with the radars that can with those vehicles. Now, the UN has a system. It's not a real-time tracking system, but it allows the UN to keep track where cars have been, so it downloads the information from this antenna uh, down to a local station, be able to monitor the, the uh, location of the car because of the GPS unit in the car. So I have to come to my conclusions. There's no technological fix to the problems of uh, human peace and conflict, but technology can be of immense value in monitoring, preventing, and mitigating conflict. Technical monitoring can increase the safety and security of peacekeepers, as well as the effectiveness of the mission. The UN, given the survey that I did, lacks the equipment, resources, preparation, and training needed for effective and efficient use of modern technology. It uses some technology in some missions when some countries have brought in the technology, but it's an ad hoc and unsystematic approach. Without uh, lacking thermal imagers that are UN-owned, they have some image intensifiers, but not the thermal imagers seismic or acoustic ground sensors. They have an absence of doctrine, SOPs and training materials, but they do, did develop a, technology mon a tech monitoring technology policy about two years ago, which helped to draft. And we need to re-engage capable co contributors. Post-Afghanistan, we now have a lot of countries that want, want to know what they're going to do with their militaries. And peacekeeping, and certainly I can see this from the Canadian example, with three of my students doing master's work on how their particular area of expertise can be used in UN peacekeeping, including uh, surveillance aircraft. And the study also showed that the UN is capable of incorporating advanced technologies. In the communications and information technology realm, the UN is world class, with uh, capable for VTCs and uh, communications within 24 hours at virtually anywhere in the world coming in sea containers. The car log example I gave, progress and GIS, you'll be hearing more about that later. The UAV in the Congo now, we have successful examples of that in the creation of a panel of experts, which hopefully will give some high-level clout to be able to make uh, substantial investments in that area. There's still a need for the capability to synthesize all that human information, which is, uh, what we, in military terms, peacekeeping operations are human-rich environments with lots of human intelligence, but how to merge that. So often technological information can tell you a lot about capabilities, but intent you need to get through the um, through the human sources. You want actionable predictive intelligence, which involves you know, uh, creating the best crystal ball you can have, and, and the early warning mandate is so prominent. And part of this trick is to have what's called shutter control, to avoid a lot of the problems we've spoken about earlier today, which is when, it, when it will you be invading on the privacy or domestic matters, which is none of the UN business, so you need to get clear rules for when to open and close the shutter, and that will be guided by your mandate. You can do the, those activities which are essential for your mandate. Final what conclusion. What I to yeah, second last slide here. Monitoring technologies are not yet tools of the trade, but they can and should be. And I'll leave you with that. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's <laughs> Thank you for this survey. Really very informative. Um, if you don't mind, I would like to go to the other speaker, and then I come back to you with a couple of questions to give the chance um, for everybody to. Um, uh, put their uh, contribution on the table. Um, so I'll move now to Elena Puglaruri, uh, who is a peace building practitioner and uh, focused particularly on the use of technology to promote peace and prevention of conflict. Um, she is the co-founder of Build Up and uh, also the co-organizer of Build Peace, which uh, just uh, a few weeks ago held a very interesting uh, workshop in, uh, in the at MIT in Boston. And, um, it was a, a fascinating uh, snapshot of uh, what is actually happening at uh, the community level, and I think which is particularly interesting uh, for the role of uh, prevention of violence and conflict. Um, 
Elena is also an author of this report, so you should really take a look at it. Um, Elena, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, so I thought perhaps I could start before going into some of the examples that I want to give you of the kind of work that we do in using technology for peace building by pointing out some of the differences in between the previous two speakers and, and the work that I do you know, as a way of framing it. So the first one is that we've been hearing about peacekeeping up to now, and what I work in are peace building projects. Um, and I think there's a, there's a qualitative difference there in terms of the approaches that we use. Uh, one is about keeping the peace, the other one is about building trust, building dialogue, and building peace. Slightly different and important to the kind of distinction that I want to make. Um, so when we um, build up, which is the, uh, the small organization that I run, the kind of work that we do um, is to work with local peace builders uh, to think through the kind of digital tools that can help them in their work. Um, one part of that is to help them in using uh, data tools, information tools to do early warning. Um, and that's actually what I'm going to focus on. Uh, but we also work um, on helping them use uh, uh, digital platforms to do online dialogue, uh, looking at digital games as a way of exploring identity. So there's a number of other things that I'm not going to touch on because I just wanted to focus on one thing. And so I'm actually quite grateful that the previous presentation was all about monitoring and the monitoring gap um, because it, it helps me also segue into what I want to, to talk about. Um, when we uh, work on early warning with local peace builders, we're also looking to fill a monitoring gap. But it's a very different kind of gap um, and one that I think technology is, is, uh, is particularly well placed to help us fill. And it's the monitoring gap of local peace builders who are trying to understand their context better for a local response. And that's very different to a kind of top-down um, extractive monitoring, which is what, and I don't say that in a negative way, because I'm very supportive of peacekeeping operations, but it's a very different kind of approach to information than the UN has when they have a big peacekeeping operation and they're observing from the top in order to have a coordinated large response. Um, the reason I want to talk to you about, the, about this particular aspect of using technology in peace building is because I think that technology actually allows for bottom-bottom uh, and bottom-up uh, collection and use of information in a way that was not possible before. And I hope that the examples I'll give you will, will illustrate that somewhat. So when we think about doing um, conflict early warning, we're doing it because uh, we fundamentally believe that conflict isn't random. In other words, we think that we uh, are going to be able to predict it with some, some ability better than chance. Um, and so most of the early warning systems, what, what, what they set up to do is to analyze past events, to identify salient risk factors, and based on those salient risk, risk factors, try to anticipate conflict that is, uh, that is going to happen later. A lot of the research into conflict early warning shows that many conflict early warning systems don't work. Um, which, at least for me, when I first came to this field, was, was somewhat surprising. Um, I'll give you one example. There was a, a recent uh, study by, the, um, by Innovations for Poverty Action, which was looking at an early warning system, conflict early warning system in Liberia. Um, and what it found was that the, the, the warning system was only marginally better than the rule of thumb that local peace builders was, were using. Only marginally better for a huge investment in, a, in an information collection and, and analysis system. Um, and and this, this speaks to the experience that I have in working with peace builders in many different settings who often will say when we open a discussion about early warning systems, listen, this is a waste of my time. You're asking me to invest time and energy, of which I have a limited amount, in something that is going to give me a piece of information that I pr probably already knew to a large extent. So, because I, you know, I actually think that information is very important and information technologies can help peace builders, I sort of dug around a little bit more on what was going on behind this. And I don't think I have a, a final answer, but I'll give you my temporary answer. And my temporary answer to this issue with systems that don't work is that too many of the early warning systems focus on structural and ecological conditions for conflict. In other words, they look at um, patterns in, in things that you can observe in the context that will allow you to predict a conflict incident. But it turns out that most peace builders aren't interested in those social and ecological uh, factors and structural factors. They're interested in motivations. They're interested in the reasons that people choose to engage in violence. And that's a very different type of information to monitor. Um, and so I think that uh, 
you know, the, the reason that they're, they're interested in, in, in trying to, to get better information about motivations um, is not only because it's, it's a more robust and systematic way of understanding why people enter into violence, but also because it actually provides a recommendation for action. A local peace builder can know a lot about the, the structural um, and the ecological factors that lead to a conflict, but there's very little they can do about it. But they can do a lot about motivations. Um, and so this is where I think technology can help. And this is the, the reason that I continue to do this work and that I'm excited about it. Um, perceptions data, which is the kind of data that you need in order to understand the motivations for people to, to enter into violence, is very messy. Um, and it's pretty difficult to collect. It's pretty difficult to analyze. Um, it's quite difficult to process as well and, and validate. Um, and I think that increasingly we, we are producing the kind of information management tools that allow local peace builders to work with that data. Um, and that is, uh, is hugely promising in terms of uh, technology for peace building. The three examples I'm going to give you, one is a use of, uh, of crowdsourcing in the Somali region. Uh, the other one is a use of uh, crisis mapping, community mapping in, uh, in Sudan, in Darfur. And the third one is an experiment with big data that I'll touch on briefly, although I have a lot of questions about it as well. Um, so I just uh, uh, arrived from Nairobi. I was in, uh, in Nairobi working with uh, three uh, fantastic organizations, Somali organizations, one from Puntland, one from Somaliland, and one from Mogadishu. And these three organizations have been working for over 15 years um, on building trust and dialogue um, around issues of statehood and, uh, and violence in the Somali region. Um, the latest thing that they're doing that I'm working with them on um, is uh, participatory polls um, that try to, to gather views about democracy um, and about the, the shape of the state in the Somali region. Um, now, up to now, when they did this kind of work, they used enumerators and paper, so it took an extremely long time for them to do anything. Um, what we're doing is we're shifting them over to um, a series of very low-cost uh, collection uh, tools um, and also data analysis tools that can be used not only at a very low cost and uh, very, make, make the work a lot more efficient, they can now run an entire poll with over 2,000 respondents in less than three weeks, which is fantastic. Um, but also they, they don't require huge amounts of statistical training in order to understand the data to the point where you can make at least some recommendations. Um, we also have introduced uh, the idea of using crowdsourcing to answer specific questions. So the vast majority of their opinion polling is still done with traditional opinion polls, but when there is one question that they want to find out more about and that they need to get an answer quickly on, they can, they can basically put out a, a short code that people can text back a response to. It has a, a, a back and forth question mechanism, so you basically text in saying hello, and the, the system will text you back the first question, you respond, it texts you back the next question, and so on. You can only really run it for sort of three or four questions, so it has to be a pretty simple topic, um, but it's still very powerful. So what that allows them to do is to have the right information to help influence policy, um, and also to target their own interventions, their own dialogue interventions a lot more effectively. So that's the Somali region. The second example is, uh, is uh, a group, uh, uh, an NGO in Sudan, a Sudanese NGO, they're called the Sudanese Development Initiative, um, that I've been working with for a number of years. And SUDIA, which is their acronym, um, works, they work all over, but they work in Darfur on this one nomadic route um, that is particularly problematic. And I won't go into the context of uh, sort of pastoralist and farmer conflicts in, in, in Darfur, but essentially um, a lot of it uh, revolves around access to resources, access to land and to water at different times, and also understanding when there is an agreement about different groups to access water or land. Um, and so in their work, they had realized that the, the communities living on that route were saying that better information would help them manage the conflict locally better. And so they've set up this system um, where they have a number of trusted um, informants along the route. Um, and each one of these informants um, has a, a mobile phone. And they know to text in um, information about particular things coded in a particular way. Um, so they can basically, in one text message, they can send quite a lot of information. Um, and so they send this information uh, on a weekly basis. Um, Sudia collects it, um, and they have a system set up to analyze it. They can map the location of all of, because they know where they all are, they can map the locations of all of these reports. They also have a way to categorize it. They can produce summary reports. 
what I really love about the system is that the main focus of collecting this information is not to inform some actor in Khartoum, but is actually to report back to the community. So what they do with that information is they produce three kinds of summaries. One is a print summary, which they hand out to people who are responding in Darfur. The second one is a radio broadcast, so they produce a script which the local radio then broadcasts. And the third one is a set of text messages that they send back to the same people who send in, sent in the information. And those are summary text messages. Um, I have a bunch of anecdotes. I, I won't go through all of them, but um, one of them that I, that I particularly like is that um, a lot of the, of the people who, who receive these text messages back will then go ahead and call all their relatives and reassure them that nobody's about to come and, and, uh, and you know, either step into their land or use their well or whatever it is that they're concerned about. So they, they're basically reducing tension by spreading this information out. Um, they also, it's a very effective way to get, um, if there's an agreement that's signed between two communities, to basically make sure that the communities north and south of it know about it. Um, so it works very well in that sense as well. The third example I wanted to tell you about, and I did say this, is, this one's a bit of an experiment, it's a bit aspirational, um, but uh, I, I don't know how many people are familiar with a thing called GDELT, the Global uh, Database on Events, Location and Tone. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big uh, database that basically gathers, um, I, I actually, I don't even know whether it's thousands or hundreds of thousands, I, probably hundreds of thousands of, uh, of uh, entries of um, uh, media, basically, so media reports um, from both international, national, local, and hyperlocal sources from around the world. And each single event in each single media source is um, coded for location, uh, um, actor, type of event, and tone. And the tone has to do with basically whether it's positive or negative. There's a, well, it's a bit more complicated than that. There's a whole scale, but essentially whether it's positive or negative. And so um, what's interesting about this database is that a number of tools are being de developed. It's, it's public and free. Um, but apart from that, there's a number of tools that are being developed to allow um, not very technical users to, to use that data to get a picture of what is happening in a particular place. Um, and so um, UNDP ran a pilot where they looked at all the data um, in about Tunis Tunisia. Um, and looked at what information they could glean from that, um, from the GDELT uh, data set. And essentially what they found, I, I was involved as an advisor in this project, and essentially what they found is that you can detect a, chain in a change in tone in Tunisia um, in, a, in, the, in the period around the revolution. Um, but you probably, you know, it's probably just a more efficient way of reading the news. Like there wasn't that much more that you got out of that apart from what you would have done if you were, you know, sort of, avid reader of, of news sources. Um, but the other thing that they found, and this is what I think is really interesting, is they found that what it did do is it gave you a much better picture of what were the interactions between the different actors. And um, uh, what, I'm going to borrow a phrase from a, from a colleague called Sandana Hatatua, who works for the ICT for Peace Foundation, for those of you who know him. And he calls that the track two social hubbub. Um, he basically says, this is how you figure out who's talking about who and who's, who's pushing who and whose opinion is kind of mattering. And the reason I think that's interesting is because when we do, when I work with local peace builders and we begin to analyze a conflict, we use systems thinking. And we do, we do a conflict map where we try to basically find what the interactions in the, in the conflict dynamic are. Um, and so I think that what, what big data could eventually help us to do is instead of using archetypes in these um, complex uh, system, you know, system dynamics um, uh, analyses, to use actual data from um, big data analytics on what are the main trends and who is speaking to, to, to who and in what tone. Um, so those are my three examples. Do I still have one minute to wrap up? Uh, no. Yeah? No, I don't? <laughs> That's it? No. Okay. Okay, you can wrap up, but uh, <laughs> leave, let's leave the example for, for later on. Okay, I don't have another example. I just wanted to basically say why I think these three are, are important. Um, and so I think, you know, basically the, the, um, the Somalia example shows you that having bottom-up information is viable, given the tools that we now have, um, and that local peace builders can challenge prevailing narratives uh, using data um, that they can collect themselves. Um, the Sudan one shows you that bottom-bottom and horizontal information sharing um, is, uh, is possible for a local response. Um, and I think the big data one um, talks about how um, increasingly more people can really touch the heart of complexity when it comes to conflict analysis. 
Um, and that's what I think technology can do for local peace builders when it comes to information systems. Great, thank you very much. Can I follow up just very quickly on the big data? Because I think this is a particularly interesting yeah. conversation. Um, you know, I, I agree very much with you on, on this idea that big data will probably, and is already telling us a lot about correlation, but not much about causation. Yeah. And the problem is because the end size you know, of, of the sample becomes so big that it's going to be extremely hard for us. There's a lot of noise mm -hmm. in that information. And from a conflict analysis point of view, you're really more interested on the why, not just on the what. Yeah. Right? Um, do you see in early warning uh, a use of big data? Where is the more promising angle of, of big data in early warning, broad, broadly speaking? If there is a, a real promising role. Yeah. Because we talk a lot about potential, right? But we never really... Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I, I'll tell you what I'm interested in. I'm not sure if this will play out to be the best use of it. But um, there's been a little bit of research on um, how uh, you can see using big data, and particularly data of on online media sources, you can see how a debate begins to polarize. Um, and so you can, you can look, and so this is again actors analysis, right? This is not about tone and events, it's about actors. So you can see who is talking about what and to whom, right? Um, and so you can have an idea of um, what are the areas of influence of different people, and what are the areas in which a particular argument is gaining um, weight? Um, and more interestingly, for, for a peace builder at least, you can also see who are the bridges. So you can see what, who are the, the people, I mean, I, I'm thinking, right now I'm thinking of Twitter, but I mean, you could think, potentially think about this with, with, uh, with other types of media. But if you can see who on Twitter is talking to whom about a particular topic, and you can also see who is in the middle and bridging the gap between those two uh, dialogues, then you would have a point of intervention. So I think the best use of big data in a more general ter sense is to think of it not as a way of predicting conflict, but as a way of understanding the levers of intervention in a conflict dynamic. Yeah, I don't know, absolutely. Thank you. Um, now let's move to yet another um, area um, of, uh, of intervention, which is uh, uh, disaster management. And uh, we have Luc St. Pierre here today, uh, who is the senior program coordinator of the UN platform for space-based information for disaster management and emergency response. Um, and his, his background as a, as a geographer, so I think it's a very, very interesting uh, professional point of view uh, on this particular issue. And, and we know that the humanitarian field is one of the fields that has done the most, actually, in applying some of these uh, mapping technologies. Uh, Luke, you have the floor. Francesco, if it's fine, I would rather... <laughs> is a bit like a chapel and uh, my name is St. Peter. I feel more comfortable here to <laughs> preach for you. Uh, I don't have any presentation though. And without starting a debate with my colleague of the UN, I would like you to appreciate that uh, uh, when we talk about humanitarian affairs, uh, excluding peacekeeping, we're talking about a different UN in a way. Uh, humanitarian agencies and not only UN but international organizations don't have the resources or the means of the peacekeeping. So any, any development integration of new technologies is at a very different scale. Uh, so the, the, please appreciate this, this, uh, this factor in my presentation. I, I will not talk much about technologies and innovation actually, but more uh, in the context we're working uh, as actors of uh, humanitarian affairs, uh, what, what are the constraints and what uh, maybe we should be looking for in terms of uh, improving their, their use or increasing their use. I will not talk much uh, also about I will not talk about all the sectors of humanitarian affairs. As Francesco mentioned, I'm coordinator of a program called SPIDER, which deals mostly with remote sensing uh, for disaster management and emergency response. Uh, we are not mandated to assist countries in improving their capabilities in uh, conflicts, in uh, population displacements. We are looking at disaster risk reduction, and uh, emergency response for disaster of natural causes of, or natural hazards, so more specific. I would, however, refer you to a, uh, the World Disaster Report uh, of last year, 2013, uh, published by, the, by IFRC, the International Federation of Red Cross and Red Crescent Societies, which focused uh, last year on technology and the future of in human intervention. You will find there a wealth of examples, practices, uh, tests that were done in different organizations dealing with every aspect of humanitarian affairs. 
the context we're working in, um, Spider and, and other agencies are mandated obviously to work priority, in priority in developing countries where we find a very weak governance structure when it comes to disaster risk reduction, emergency response, uh, to the management of geographic information in general. <clears throat> the human resources and financial res uh, resources, as you know, are, are very are, are highly insufficient, but there's also a lack in many countries of a long-term vision on to how to develop and consolidate and sustain those, those resources. Um, very often, and maybe that's the link with the previous speakers, most of the actions that we have to, 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 to facilitate or support uh, take place in countries where the population suffering from disasters are also suffering from conflicts, uh, which makes the, the, the impacts much bigger, but which makes also the actions much more difficult to take. The, the security is an issue, displacement access is, are always issues. In terms of information, the, the core data sets are either completely missing, incomplete, inaccurate, poorly organized, not accessible, and even worse, they're not shared at all. So there's, those are the usual, the, the, the context we're working with. Uh, so SPIDER, in that, with that perspective, SPIDER ensures that, wants to ensure that all countries, international, regional organizations have access to and develop the capacity to use all type of space-based information. Big word to say remote sensing, earth observation data mostly and very importantly, to support the full disaster management cycle. And I'm insisting on the word full. Uh, I, will, I will get back to that later. What we do, uh, we're not operational in the sense that we won't mobilize teams, we won't set instruments or tools or develop or do research, but we'll uh, provide uh, advisory services to our member states on how they can improve their capabilities in accessing and managing uh, information that can be useful uh, to them. We do that by uh, developing good practices in knowledge management, information sharing, <coughs> sorry, uh, data exchange practices and all that. We're also very uh, active in trying to bridge communities uh, involved with responsibility or authorities in disaster management or emergency response. Um, I always say the two because they are technical distinctions, but you, you get, you get the, the, the grip of it. Uh, those communities can be uh, space agencies, national, regional, private companies who are, uh, are operating satellites, for example, who are acquiring, selling, distributing uh, satellite imagery. They might be part of international mechanism to make that imagery accessible, free of charge in case of disaster. Uh, they can be provider of a global navigation system for navigation and uh, geoposition. Uh, they can be also provider of satellite telecommunication uh, services, which are uh, important also in both uh, early warning aspects and uh, response. I mentioned, uh, I refer earlier to the full disaster uh, cycle or disaster management cycle. Uh, you've seen and you may probably involve also in activities where technologies are useful, tested and, and, and or used in terms of emergency response at the onset of a disaster, earthquake, floods, tsunami, or later on. But there are probably more applications, more interest in developing the, those technologies and those tools for preparedness, mitigation, early warning prior to the possible disaster. A little bit like Elena told us about this early warning for conflicts. There are many applications for, from these uh, space-based applications that uh, are being developed, implemented, but probably face more uh, constraints at different time between, between preparedness and response and recovery, uh, you will find different actors, okay? maybe different government authorities, different NGOs working. They will need different type of data, they will need different type of information, different scale, different uh, resolution. Um, and the solutions have to be adapted to these different things. And that's what we're working on mostly, trying to characterize what is needed at what time and by whom, and, and working with the governments to help them develop that governance structure that will help them uh, develop the, the, the capabilities. Uh, I can take the example, I mean, when we think of natural hazard and disasters, we think of earthquakes, tsunamis, and floods. Actually, the most important damaging and, and in terms of lives and, and resources uh, type of disasters are floods and drought and not independently. The, the, the combined effect of floods and droughts is becoming the main threats to the whole, the whole world. But both are treated differently. Most of the governed uh, countries will have different authorities responsible for floods. 
Those would be water institutes, uh, hydrologic, uh, meteorological services, then those responsible for droughts, which would be Ministry of Agriculture, for example. So if you don't have the governance structure to, for those institutions to work together to, and to change data, to work together at acquiring more information, at developing their human resource capacity, the, the dual uh, disaster of drought and floods will never be well managed. So it's not necessarily the... I mean, I, I'm, since I was at UNHCR before do, doing refugee camp mapping with remote sensing, mobile data collection, the tools are there, the technology exists, okay? And it's not the UN who's developing it, but we're, contrary to, again, to, to Ms. Ack earlier, saying that the UN is behind uh, development, as a system it is, but believe me, in the field, at the senior, at the uh, mid-level management level, the capacity is there. There's so much good ideas, there's so much, so much initiative. So it, it's a matter of arranging the, the, the system to be, to be uh, more in, in, in line with the development. So just to say that, to me, the tools exist. It's easy to grab something that functions, that work, that is accessible, that might be free even. But to make it work in a country where the conditions are not present, where the education level is not there, where the technical capacities is not there, where, where professional staff who might have access to a master degree in Europe will have to find that themselves. They will find the grant themselves. They might have to resign for their job to go and study and, and then find something else later. There are very few institutions with, with which we work that have a human resource development program. How do you manage to, to get resources to send your staff to that training to make sure that they will come back and work with you and that they will, the training will be well targeted? So it's really not the technology for me that are the problem, it's the, the context to make it useful. And, and, and be it uh, satellite telecommunication, for example, we, 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 use, uh, we use that every day, but very often uh, the responders are, uh, need satellite telecommunication from the onset of a disaster because mobile networks are the first one to fall down. Um, mobile, uh, uh, sorry, it, it's also useful for data transfer. So again, the technologies in private sector in uh, government institutions exist in, in, in many countries, but not uh, easily adaptable in the field. Uh, mobile technologies, again at UNHCR, we started to develop a few years back mobile data collections, doing surveys in refugee camps on trying to replace older technology using paper. That is being used now more, much more widely. Uh, but again, the constraints we were facing were not technological, they were not financial. It was the head of a refugee camp that said, why should I, should I invest in buying 10 cellular phones installing a server for these services, when with that money I can buy 500 jerry can and build 20 tents and maybe hire a doctor for a few months. So again, the, 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 the context is not always favorable to the implementation of these tools. Uh, global navigation system is also one of the space-based applications that is essential. Uh, we, 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 we use, you use your GPS and your car on your phone every day and we think that those services exist and it's free and it's fine. Most of the regions where we have to work, the coverage of GPS or other GNSS services is very weak, is not accurate enough, the coverage is not perfect. So working with private sector who are providers of services is important to make sure to identify as UN, what are the priorities, where, what are the hot areas, the hot spots that we need to work and where this is important. So that also GNSS services can be developed by private companies in those countries. If there is no good services, you will not see the, the, the realm of application that you have here, in, in, uh, for example, in Europe. Uh, so th those services need to be developed. And that's where UN agencies are working. We're trying to promote that. And, and when I said earlier that SPIDER tries to develop bridges between communities, that's what we do. We had, we had a workshop last year where we had crowdsource and crisis mapper communities sitting with space agencies and provider of GNSS. And say, this is what we can do, uh, it, but the products that you're making available are useless to us, they're not timely, that's not what we want. Space community will say, yeah, crowdsourcing is good, but we don't know about the data quality. We sat together for three days and opened open up a little bit the discussion and it helped, it's, it's far from being finished. The main tool though is uh, Earth, Earth observation uh, tools, remote sensing data. Uh, SPIDER program focuses on remote sensing, meaning from space uh, platforms. There are, of, of course, in humanitarian sector, the use of UAVs. We saw that, even of balloons. Uh, but again, when I say there is, there's a different UN within the humanitarian affairs, when we talk, talk about UAVs for camp mapping or emergency response, we talk about machine of 
50, 70 centimeters that are hand launched, uh, controlled with a mobile phone and, phone, and that costs $15,000. So not high altitude, permanently flying UAVs, collecting lots of data. It's a very different context. And when I started, tried to, to use UAVs in Eastern Chad in 2008, I think with a private co uh, research company, uh, sorry, research uh, spin-off at the University of Lausanne, they were, we were ready to try it in the field. We never got the clearance to import immigration uh, customs in the country. And then the security officer told us, this is great, I love that tool, they were with us on a demonstration. If you fly that in a refugee camp in Eastern, uh, Eastern China, it will be shut down by rebels in about 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. So the conditions, the field conditions, again, are not always there for, for technologies. And you have to understand, to assess, and, and observe a little bit what is possible. So in terms of satellite imagery, I will, I will finish soon. There's a, obviously more and more high resolution imagery, meaning you can see smaller objects and map at a much higher level of details. The coarser or the more refined, sorry, the more uh, highest resolution you get, uh, the more expensive it is. And it's not always the best tool. We, we spent quite a bit of energy. I was in, in uh, Central America a few weeks ago, and we had quite a hot discussion with the Minister of, Envi Minister of Environment. He wanted to have high resolution imagery over El Salvador because it's a small country. And I, Sorry, you don't have the money, you don't have the resources to analyze it, you don't have the storage capacity for that kind of volume. Don't forget medium resolution, low resolution imagery that are free of charge that uh, could be extremely useful to do land use mapping, land use changes, which is critical in terms of uh, identifying risk. Vulnerability mapping, you don't need high resolution. There are a range of solutions that are uh, accessible that needs to be, to be exploited. Um, we talk about radar imagery, which is not dependent to cloud cover, to night or day, uh, but again, the processing of that is more complex, the analysis, the understanding of those products. So you need the local, the national capacity to use those things. There's no point in, in pushing for these technologies to be further developed if we cannot assimilate what exists already. Same thing with micro or nano or cube satellites. They're, 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 they're becoming almost a nuisance in a way because it will increase drastically the traffic in space. Our office uh, for outer space affairs deals with the long-term sustainability of space, trying to have uh, rules on these micro satellites. There are all kinds of issues that, that uh, hinder a little bit the expansion of those technologies. Elevation model, again very quickly. Uh, we have access to free elevation model, which are critical to produce risk map, flood map. Um, but what is available now is at 90 meters. Some Providers are starting to make available elevation model at 10 meters, 5 meters, which can become useful in a place like Bangladesh, for example, where the denivelation is very small. But the cost, the volume of data, the, the, the technology is still uh, very expensive. So we're working as, as a group, uh, as a group because there are interagency efforts uh, within the UN to work with these providers. Um, just to finish, I will talk about some risk about technological innovation. I refer to some, some examples, and we heard about uh, different cases. Data sensitivity is, uh, is critical, and even more so when we start working with volunteer group, um, what, what we can do, what, how we, we, we screen, we filter, we disseminate information is critical. Big data, we heard different ex uh, examples of big data. What I can add to it, one of the, the risks is that there is too much data, of course, by definition. If we look at the case of the earthquake in Haiti in 2010, I believe, there were hundreds of maps produced every day by different uh, organizations, agencies. Less than 1% of those maps were useful in the field. There was a survey saying, this, is, this looks good, looks good on my wall, but it's useless in the field. Target the needs, understand the user requirement, understand the local capacity, and what is really needed is, is critical. Uh, and again, just to finish uh, in conclusions, we. Ms. Ack mentioned the need for education at the professional level, at the technical level, starting at the uh, secondary level in developing countries. We need to bring, to facilitate, uh, to have programs promoting the development of those technologies, research and testing in, in country itself. And prioritize, as I said earlier, there's no point in having good ideas that will cost $10,000 in cell phones if that the first the needs in health education are not fulfilled. So we need to prioritize and convince also. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Thank you very much. Uh, incidentally, I mean, I see so many synergies between the things that you are doing, Spider is doing, and what we were talking before in, in peace mm -hmm. operation. And maybe one of the things that also the Spider Group can do is looking into in the UN system and what already exists and what can be moved to other 
part of the system. Um, since we only have five, 15 minutes, I would like to open the floor, and then maybe I will add a couple of, of questions. So please. Can we have a microphone here, please? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Saeed Khattali from the Minister of Foreign Affairs in Libya. And I enjoyed these uh, talks very much because they are more related to my work. My profession, I am an electrical engineer. I have been teaching communication radar satellites. And I did my PhD on ground penetrating radar. Now, what, what am I doing in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs? That's I don't really could not answer until now. With these talks, at least I could find something that we could do together. So I invite anyone who has any ideas that could be used in the peace keeping or mo peace monitoring in Libya, I would appreciate that they contact me. You know, in the, in, in the early morning when they showed the map of the world, there were so many red spots in Libya. So there are conflicts inside, there are borders, you know, uh, arms, drugs, people crossing, they are about 4,000 kilometers. And there is about 1,500 kilometers of, of seashore. They are all not monitored. And there are warring groups sometimes. Most of the time they are at peace, but it could erupt at any time. So how to use these technologies in this situation? I would like to appreciate anybody, anybody who has ideas to contact me, please. And thank you very much. Thank you very <coughs> much. Yes, border monitoring is something very important. Although I can see some political sensitivities about that in the, in, in the UN. Um, Anybody else from the, from, the, from the floor? So let me add maybe a couple of points while you may be thinking of some questions. Um, um, look, you made a couple of uh, sort of negative examples uh, from your field. Um, some example in, in natural disaster management where technology was really useful and, and particularly uh, lessons that came out of it that maybe you can mention to us. And, and two, uh, Walter, I, I was thinking, uh, there is a group of experts now um, I don't want to anticipate anything, but uh, in the UN context, always limited resources, both financial and, and human resources. Uh, if you had to identify one or two priorities that you would recommend to the leadership uh, in terms of technology and peace, where the focus should be. So I want, should we go maybe in, uh, in, uh, in reverse order and, and start with Luke and then, uh, and I mean, unless there is, oh, there is another question there, so let's take this other question and then we wrap up. Uh, is uh, right there, Slim. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, you just mentioned uh, the problem with, uh, uh, I mean, the accuracy of the information uh, that uh, the space agency mentioned, etc. And that made me uh, uh, think about uh, what uh, uh, you just said before about that project in uh, with the SMSs uh, for preventing conflicts, uh, and, uh, uh, and di did you think about information security? Because that system seems also uh, very good at uh, creating conflicts with false informations. So uh, uh, it would be easy if someone gets access to that system to create big conflicts. And the th then uh, you also talked about um, I mean, what you think about big data and uh, how it could be used to identify bridges in mm -hmm. social networks, etc. Uh, uh, and this is also, I think, uh, I there is a perspective of information security because those bridges will, will be also critical targets uh, in different kinds of uh, situations. So those two aspects of information security about the systems you are building or you are uh, or the projects you are making uh, did you think about them and how w would you solve them and i have uh, just a one uh, last precision about the database you talked about uh, what what is it is it uh, open j uh, g g delt g d e l t global database on events location and tone okay Thank um, you. i can give you the website later 
It's an open source, so you should, it you should find open, it. Yeah. You should That's find it out. Thank you. And also, thank you for linking what we're discussing here to the panel, to the previous panel, which is, of course, there are some serious connection there. Um, is okay? We move uh, yeah. in the opposite order. Look, please. Yeah, and uh, you're asking for a successful example. Uh, there are many, luckily. I can go back to the example I mentioned where we used, uh, when I was at UNHCR, the High Commissioner for Refugees, we used mobile phones to collect data in the refugee camp. Uh, there were, on an annual basis, surveys on the use of mosquito net against uh, malaria in refugee camp uh, because mosquito net, there were schemes to sell, give mosquito nets, but the use of it was not clear and most of the time people might be reselling the nets that were given. So there was a survey on how much it was used and quite detailed survey. And we ran uh, using open source software, working with an NGO, uh, we created the, the, the same forms on mobile phones. Uh, we trained uh, local staff half a day on how to use and fill the forms. And we did it with mobile phones in one refugee camp. Uh, I don't remember the figures exactly, but something like 1,500 interviews. While it was done in a second refugee camp that was in, in Kenya uh, with the traditional means, with paper forms. Um, at the end of the two-week period, we had finished the interviews with phones. It was also finished with paper. But the Saturday after, we had produced charts, analysis, and all the trends, all the data that was needed. Six months after, in the other camp, they realized that the data entry from paper to computer was all wrong. They had to do it again. So at more than six months after, they didn't have any data, and they had a room filled with stinky paper. Uh, but still, I was confronted with the fact that we had to buy phones, that we had to pay an NGO, that we had to buy a, a server, and maybe have someone to, to uh, download the data and produce those charts, compared to the needs in health and education. But the benefits of the, 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 the result is, to us, was clear, and, and, but we have to balance and, 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 and be real, realistic also, understand what, what is possible. Of course, I left UNHCR and uh, NGO lady got pregnant and uh, funds were cut and this is not happening anymore in the section I was working. But another section in another camp managed to take it up and is still working with, with those tools. Uh, that's, that's why I was saying also there's, there's a wealth of energy, good ideas at the field level, at the operational level that is not always recognized and, 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 and brought. And it's partly our fault. We should be able to sell those ideas and good concepts and tools to senior management so it's prioritized and integrated and, and the program, uh, program activities. Thank you for mentioning also information management, which I think within the UN, we're talking about a lot about outside, but within the UN would be a massive improvement if I think on how many people keep writing talking points without really being able to access previous talking points, right? If you just had a, an internal Google desk, that would solve all, that, all, that, all those problems. Uh, Helena. So I'll just answer Yes, maybe you question. can answer those questions. Yeah. Um, so, um, Slim, you already heard me say this last night, but I'm just going to repeat it for everybody else. I think one of the, when I work with local peace builders and they ask about information security and whether any of the systems that we're setting up are secure, I always tell them that since we don't have the resources to provide adequate security training or adequate security tools, they should assume that everything we do is absolutely public. Um, and then what we do is we analyze the risks of that data being public and of other people, of spoilers is the language that is used in conflict analysis, so of spoilers utilizing that system. So that's the general answer, specifically on the Sudan case. Um, actually, you missed the biggest risk, uh, which is what happened the first time we set it up in, uh, in the east of Sudan in, uh, in Blue Nile State, which is that it was shut down by the government. Um, so it never got anywhere. Um, so what we know about the, the system in Darfur is um, that we are only communicating the information that the government is comfortable with us communicating back and forth, um, and that at any point it could be infil infiltrated by, by, well, that it probably is already being read by the government, but that it could also, they could also send messages through it. Um, we know that, and therefore we know that's the space that we operate within. But even within that space, it is a very useful system, as long as you know that's the space you're operating in, right? So that's the first one. The issue that you bring up with big data is um, a lot more complex. I don't think we have the time to talk about it, but I'll just say very briefly. Um, I think there is, you're absolutely right that there is a question about, um, which links to what, what, you, what your panel was talking about, about the difference in between somebody putting out a tweet and somebody mapping all the tweets and drawing an inference from it. 
Um, and I don't, um, I don't feel that I'm equipped with the right ethical framework to analyze whether that would be, you know, if we start doing that systematically in conflict settings, what that would do to peace building in general. Um, but I do think that we need a better ethical framework to answer that question. Because this work is so incipient yet, and I don't, I mean, in most of the places where I work, there's not enough da big data to do anything, uh, to draw any inferences. Some people try to do it with uh, big data in Egypt, and, and basically we're drawing all the wrong inferences because the, the data set is, is too skewed to a very urban, very male, very young population. So I, I don't have an answer. I think it is a problem, and I would love to talk more about it. Yes, massive biases problem there, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, Jessica, to answer your question about uh, possible examples of systems under limited resources, fortunately, the technologies are getting cheaper and cheaper, so it's, it becomes easier and easier to answer that question. Um, if you're talking about very cheap systems, um, I would say that solar-powered illuminators are a great device. People have them in their driveways, on their front steps of their house. Why can't the UN put them in pl spots where there are uh, dangers? So somebody's walking by in, in the middle of the night, then a luminator comes on, they know that, they're, that there's, a, there's a potentially someone watching or that, that the people around them can see that they're coming in. Yeah, it's those, they cost less than $50 now, and they can be solar powered. So that's, uh, that's useful. Now the next step up would be to put a little camera on there in, in areas where the UN could have, um, wants to have some surveillance and um, refugee camps so that you see the outer edges or if somebody might be coming down the road. That would be very uh, useful. And then if you want to extend that, put it on a balloon above a ref refugee camp. People who are out on firewood patrols, they know where to come back easier. Plus, they, there's a camera on there, and they can see a further distance on the horizon. If uh, you're talking about Darfur, Janjaweed attacks, or, or, or vehicles approaching, uh, better knowledge management. So those are, those are all now quite cheap. You know, you're talking about uh, d dozens of dollars to hundreds of dollars few thousand. Um, if you want to get more, more expensive, then I get something like the mobile vehicular systems, which can be used, and, and even start considering about technology that can be moved from one mission to another mission based on emergencies. So you really need a monitoring system at this time in this place, then have it just like they do about comm systems. You can move the satellite dish, have it set up really quickly, and then that's a form of intermission cooperation. Thank you very much. I didn't answer about Libya, but uh, uh, maybe you have yeah, yeah. later. Yeah. Um, thank you. On uh, the you know what technologies are, are um, you know that, that we should look at, I, I think it coincides a lot with what uh, what Walter has said. But let me just frame it in terms of saying that what we really need to improve is our situational awareness. You know, what is it that we can do? that improves our situational awareness. And that's really the, the critical element. So some of the things that Walter has said, you know, the aerostat, you know, uh, um, these tethered balloons which can go up with cameras. Of course, UAS, uh, very, very important. Uh, some of the other things that he mentioned briefly in his presentation, infrared thermography, uh, thermal imaging, uh, some of these things, again, which give us real-time <coughs> information. But as I said, with that situation, awareness has to also come the ability for us to move quickly to areas that we think are potential hotspots, and that means that we need to, to increase our mobility uh, in those areas. And so in, in that context, I mean, you know, aviation assets, first and foremost, when we procure them commercially, they're expensive. And it's very difficult for us to get the kind of military utility helicopters and military attack helicopters that we require from member states. This is a constant uh, request that we make over and over again. Uh, and we are seeing now a little bit more of that in terms of what people call Afghanistan factor, that with the withdrawal uh, that we see a, a little bit more coming. Peacekeeping budget right now is at $8 billion, which is kind of a ceiling, I think, with the new missions that, uh, that uh, and in, uh, you know, uh, additional enhancements and other missions, it, it will go up even further. And so, therefore, we need to work with the experts like Walter. We have internally resource efficiency group. What we are, have done so far is we've reduced the per capita cost of a peacekeeper by 16%. But the overall cost of, of, uh, of uh, peacekeeping because of new missions and everything else is going up. Uh, so again, you know, we have that, uh, that uh, very strong sort of balance. But I would say 
any kind of technology that enhances our situational awareness and gives us the mobility with that situational awareness is what we're looking for. Terrific. Thank you very much. I think we reached the end of this panel. It was a very interesting session. Thank you to our panelists and thank you to you for following. Mm -hmm.